everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Um, doing things a little bit differently with this video, we're going to be talking through the topics of accuracy and contamination. So I'm going to give you some information about how these things are crucial in forensic science and how what we can do to address that. So let's think, why do we need accuracy? Why does it matter in forensic science? Okay, well, you think about the, the, the stakes are really high. When we're conducting scientific investigations um, that potentially could impact on someone's freedom, whether they are convicted of a crime or they are acquitted or, or whatever that, that outcome might be, that we need to conduct our analysis very seriously and very carefully because we any sloppy work may have very serious consequences. Okay, so the, there's um, we're going to be considering two main areas that we as forensic scientists need to address accuracy and then contamination. Okay, but so accuracy, when we're using this term, we're th talking about the degree of closeness or, or of a particular quantity, you know, mass, concentration, or whatever, to an actual or true value. So, how close is our measurement to how much is actually in that sample? And then thinking about contamination, we're thinking about in the inclusion of foreign material in the sample from an outside source. Okay, so it could be something like DNA, could be fingerprints or trace evidence, could be bacteria or other kind of foreign material. Um, so it could be purely accidental, just through carelessness or recklessness, or, or it could also be um, deliberate contamination for a, a range of reasons. Okay, so <clears throat> we're first going to think about con some of the issues around contamination, making sure that we can um, keep our samples in pristine condition, um, and so we're going to consider these four areas. The first one, so proper sample handling, sample storage, cleanliness, and adopting careful thorough work practices. Okay, so proper sample handling. So making sure that we are packaging items separately and in appropriate containers for the type of evidence. Okay, so we're keeping, this is particularly important when we're going to keep um, samples from the victim and suspect separate from one another because we don't want any incidental contact to happen between these two things that then would suggest that there was a connection there that may not actually be justified. Okay, because that has happened in the past. M most of these things have happened in the past, which is why we're, we're discussing them now. Okay, to make sure that there's nothing, no potential contamination of, of items from one thing to another. Making sure that containers are sealed, so there's no chance that anything could, could get in that way. Especially with trace evidence, where it, it often very little material is involved. Okay, so looking at sample storage, so making sure that we're storing things at the correct temperature, especially for biological samples like blood, okay, because we don't want any degradation. We don't want that sample to break down over time or to spoil, okay? It means that um, we also need it to be secure so that there's no chance of tampering um, or, um, yeah, or any deliberate um, contamination that, that might happen. Okay, excuse this typo there. Okay, another thing that we can do with that uh, for blood evidence in particular, that we can add preservatives into that blood sample so that it doesn't degrade over time because of um, uh, the action of microbes. Okay, this is particularly important in terms of um, assessing levels of ethanol in the blood because um, bacteria that exist in, in the body and in, in natural samples can, um, by through their action with the tissue, often produce ethanol. And so in a body that has been um, dead for a few days, um, that there, there can be a significant blood alcohol level um, in that body that was not there before the person died, purely just because of um, this action. Preservatives help to uh, keep those sorts of things in check. Okay, and so then aside from sample storage, um, making sure we also are very clean in the way that we work. So using disposable equipment, whether it's um, gloves, using pipettes, um, but when we're ha handling samples, cover all clothing that um, covers over our own uh, personal clothing so that trace evidence and items from us as the forensic scientists aren't transferred to um, the item in question. And also that, you know, trace evidence um, it can be transferred in both ways. So we're not picking up any trace from the, the samples that we're testing, which may then be transferred onto other things later on. Okay, so making sure that we use all sort of personal protective equipment um, and avoiding the, the chance of um, shedding any DNA into hairs and fibres and, and things like that where that may, um, that transfer may happen. Okay, 
Um, and then also making sure that the way that we work, the policies, the procedures, the methods that we use are careful and thorough. So using established and verified procedures um, and making sure that we're following those procedures really methodically. We're very careful in the way that we work so that we're not being sloppy. We're not being reckless or rushed. We're making sure we do things right. Okay, and when that in also involves no cutting corners, making sure that we complete things properly rather than just you know, we need to get home or we need to need to, to do whatever that, and so therefore uh, rushing through things because that's often when these sorts of mistakes can occur. Okay, so now we're going to address the, the second kind of half of this presentation, thinking about accuracy and also reliability and how those two things kind of connect together. Okay, so some of the things that we're going to be doing with that, these are, uh, we're looking at using tried and tested methods. We're going to look at the concept of replication. We're going to address the concept of uh, looking at the idea of standardization. And then um, two related kind of terms of quality assurance, QA, and quality control, QC, which are really going to um, help to increase our accuracy and reliability above reproach. Okay, so the first one, tried and tested methods. So making sure that the techniques that we use um, that, that we're um, can, you know, analyzing evidence that we're, we're looking for things have been tested in court and are shown to be valid. So they're well documented. Okay, so statistical analysis looking at is, is often a tool that would, would be used to demonstrate the effectiveness of a technique um, and to show, um, you know, so yeah, to, to basically to back up its use. In, in particular examinations. Okay, so now this, this is a challenge because this can take time. We'll, we'll address um, address the kind of a concept with that in a sec. But also making sure that the procedure that we use, even for instruments that have been used very thoroughly before, you know, for a very long time, making sure that the procedure that we follow um, has been well checked, that we're not using it in a way that is is invalid. Okay, um, now we can, this is kind of coming back to that first point that, you know, tried and tested in court and shown to be valid. Well, ultimately, at some point, it had to be used the first time. Okay, you can't be shown to be valid and haven't been tested in court without being used at some point. And so, we that there is scope to do that. The court can accommodate novel techniques that develop. However, it has to, we have to be cautious with it, doing these sorts of things. We need to be careful in how it's applied and also to demonstrate that there is a high probative value. Um, which we addressed in it, the, the previous video, the idea that there's plenty of information that can be gathered by using these techniques that warrants the use of something that's novel, that's a bit different, that the court hasn't seen before. Um, and so, yeah, but we do have to tread carefully so that we're not um, using something which is then shown later on to be false or to be invalid or unreliable. Okay, because you can imagine in that context that how bad that would be. Then looking at the concept of replication, so uh, this you may not have seen this word before, but addressing this this idea is something that you are familiar with, the, the concept of repeating measurements. So um, using repeat measurements, calculating averages, constructing calibration lines or scatter graphs and calculating lines of best fit. Um, in analytical chemistry, we also can, um, can quantify the accuracy of our line of best fit using something what we call the correlation coefficient. R squared, and that helps to, to demonstrate how strong a relationship there is between two variables. Okay, so making sure that when we're analysing samples, we're doing multiple analyses per sample, and that we're also um, doing multiple samples per item of evidence. So not only are we teaching to a, a, analysing a given sample more than one time just to check with the machine, but we're actually analysing multiple samples from the same item. You know, so maybe it's multiple blood samples from a given person, as well as testing each blood sample several times. Okay, doing different sample sites. You know, so if we're looking at um, hair from someone's head, you know, collecting hairs from a range of different places on someone's head. It's not just one hair, but you know, maybe up from upwards of a hundred different hairs from different places on their head, because our our hair doesn't always grow uniformly, um, and all with the same sort of appearance for example okay and so this can help and, and and this is also really important with things like soil where there is a, it can be quite a variable quantity and so you need to, you can't just check in one spot you need to check in many different spots so that you can you can get an accurate comparison you can see the big picture Another approach that we use is this idea of standardization, that is using standards or reference samples that we use and we compare our results against. 
Okay, so we're testing them alongside our samples. Now, we can test them alongside our, our samples in, in two kind of ways, that they're actually included into the sample that we are testing. We call that an internal standard. Okay, so it's added into the sample it, itself. Or we can use an external standard, which is a sample that's run alongside our, the sample that we're interested in. Okay, so they're two, two vials in the, in the machine next to one another. Okay, or they're two kind of, you know, um, microscope slides, one after the other, okay, as opposed to an internal standard, which might be introduced into the vial of the sample that we're about to test, okay, there's, there's, there's arguments for and against either, um, but we're not really going to go into the nature of those types of standards beyond that scope, that's, you know, university analytical chemistry, but um, there's, there's pros and cons. Okay, and so these are this is typically how we might structure our analysis. So looking at our comparison material, so what we're actually trying to analyze, the reference material that we're comparing it against. And then two things that are also really important to check the validity of our procedure, a control sample, which is identical to the sample we're testing except for the compound we're looking for. Okay, because especially important in natural, like biological samples, it may be very complex. Okay, so if you're looking, um, testing a urine sample for the presence of a, um, maybe a, looking at doping in a, um, in sport, you're going to be comparing a, a blank urine sample. Okay, which contains all the other things that urine does, um, except for the compound that we're trying to find. Okay, or maybe it's a blood sample that doesn't contain any alcohol that we're comparing against um, a, a sample that we suspect to have um, a, a certain amount of alcohol in it. And then the other thing that we do is a, a blank, which is nothing but the solvent, nothing but, you know, maybe it's water or ethanol or um, ethyl acetate or something else that we use to test the instrument. Okay, so that doesn't contain all the other complicated stuff, um, it's just a solvent. Um, okay, just to make sure that that one should be completely blank. There should be nothing produced. Okay, and if the instrument is producing something, then that tells us something's up. Um, so that it's kind of like a double checking mechanism. Okay, and speaking of double checking, we get to kind of our last main point, talking about quality assurance and quality control. And so probably the shorthand way you could understand that quality assurance is what you do before you do the testing. Quality control is what you do to check after and during the testing. So quality, so QA is in setting things up and QC is your monitoring, basically. Okay, so it's the systems that we put in place to ensure that both the, the, the lab, the instrument and the analyst, analysts are producing reliable and accurate results. Okay, so, you know, colloquially we might say they're the checks and balances. The things that we would do to make sure that things are working the way that they should, um, whether that's at the big picture, the level of the lab itself and its own systems, the instrument we're using and the people that are using it. Okay, so some of the examples of, of things that we might put in place, double checking, you know, so different analysts doing things, repeating things on a different day with the same analyst or maybe a different analyst, you know, having another look at things. Um, once analysis has been done, reports are done, that peer review of the results, getting a second opinion, um, um, and also reading over expert reports and giving feedback on that, um, and, and kind of checking through the results. Okay, that this is the sort of thing that used to happen when I was working in forensics, that we would always get a, one of the other experts to have a look at the report and to go through and to, to check and see the wording and the extent of the conclusions and so on and see if that was justified. Um, and then also that involves things like checking, that, making sure that the, the laboratory is accredited. So which uh, process that we're, we're checking through the processes, we're checking through the procedures, the documentation that the lab has. It's carried out by a group called NATA, the National Association of Testing Authorities. Um, so that they're the group that will do the accreditation. Um, if you are accredited by them, that carries a lot of weight. If you are not accredited by them, that is also interesting in, you know, like that, that carries weight as well. Now, um, on a very small scale, thinking about small private um, laboratories like, you know, question document um, laboratories and things like that, where there might be one or two per people working together, okay, NATA accreditation, you know, is a, a, a big deal in that sort of situation that's that's often not done, um, but certainly at a, a large scale government laboratory or large scale private laboratory that NATA accreditation would be mandatory. Um, and that this also is not just limited to uh, forensic laboratories, this is all sorts of laboratories, like you'd have at a hospital, 
um, or you'd, you know, where you'd send your blood samples for, for different things that, that this exists too. And also for anti-doping laboratories, like if they're testing um, sport, you know, samples for drugs in sport, um, the IOC is responsible for um, doing that sort of level of accreditation. Okay, so just wrapping it up now, you can see that um, accuracy and contamination are, are crucial things in forensic science, that we need to know what they are, and we also need to put in place policies and, and um, systems that, that will allow us to get accurate and reliable results and minimise contamination of samples, because the stakes are really high and we've got to do a good job. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.